You're listening to the Teach Better Talk podcast featuring expert educators eager to share progressive tactics to reach more students. Teach Better Talk is created by teachers and fueled by passion. Let's get started. Hey everyone, welcome to episode four of Teach Better Talk. I'm Ray Hewitt, and as always, I'm with the wonderful Jeff Gargas. So before we get started, we have absolutely so much in store for this episode, but I first have to ask, Jeff, how you doing? Ray, I am doing fantastic. I am really pumped up. We are in episode number four, and we have a phenomenal educator with us, Thomas C. Murray. Tom serves as, a, he does a lot of stuff. So after 15, he's spent 15 years in the public uh, uh, school systems. He did a whole variety of things in, in that uh, spectrum, and I'll let, he'll talk about that a little bit today. But he also serves as Director of Innovation for Future Ready Schools. Um, and that's a project of the Alliance for Excellent Education, which is in Washington, D.C., he has testified before the United States Congress. He's worked alongside that body in the U.S. Uh, Senate, the White House, the U.S. Department of Education, and State Departments of Education, um, and school districts throughout the country. Um, and he works and, and helps them to implement student-centered personalized learning um, while also helping to lead Future Ready Schools and Digital Learning Day. Um, wow. He also, he's a, const- he's a, he's a regular keynote. Uh, you and I actually got to see him about, about a month ago, keynote, and it was fantastic. Yeah, one um, of my favorites. He was named one of the 20 to watch by NSBA. Um, he's been named the National Global Ed Tech Leader of the Year, I think, in 2018. He was the Education Thought Leader of the Year in 2017 and the Education Policy Person of the Year by the Academy of Arts and Science 2015. Oh, and on the side, he's also a best-selling author uh, of the book, <laughs> Learn and Transform, which is absolutely fantastic. It's an ASCD bestseller. I think it was, it was released in 2017. And I think one of the most important things about Tom is that all these things that he's done and all these awesome accolades that we can list off and stuff, he's a teacher at heart, 15 years um, teaching in public schools. And Tom, Tom, we are so excited to have you here. Really, really appreciate you taking some time to chat with us. And so first and foremost, how are you feeling right now today? Uh, it is awesome to be with you all today. I'm a little sleep deprived, but uh, as we all are, um, but things are well and I'm excited to be with you. Thanks for having me on. And episode four. Wow. That's kind of towards the top of the list. I I, must have, I was thinking you ran out of people and that's why you <laughs> asked me, but uh, that's awesome. Chance. Excited to be with you today. So uh, let's jump in. Let's hang out. So let's talk about you more. I know Jeff gave you this fabulous introduction, all these great things that you've done. I mean, we are so honored to have you here. But when someone actually asks you what you do, what do you what do you tell them? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny because occasionally I'll hear my mom or my dad, they'll be telling a friend, yeah, Tom, Tom does this. And I'm like, None, wait, what? are you talking about another kid that you have? Because that, <laughs> that's not me at all. Here's here's the thing. And, and I appreciate the wonderful intro and, and the accolades and throwing those out there. And thank you for that. But listen, it none of that really matters in my eyes when it boils down to my heart and why I do what I do. You know, we work a lot so many times and, and kind of give you the broad stroke over Overall, I work with school and district leaders around the country, and I want to pause right there. When I say leader, I'm not talking leader by title. And one of the aspects of the things that um, Eric and I wrote in Learning Transformed is this notion of leader by title versus leader by action. When I say when I work with school leaders, I'm talking about teachers, support staff members, or principals, whatever the case is. And sure, many times my work is with school administrators by title, but some of the greatest leaders that I've ever seen in schools is the fifth year teacher that runs through walls for kids every single day. And so when I talk about being able to work with school leaders, I'm talking about those folks there as well. And so my work there is nationally. Um, on one hand, the Alliance for Excellent Education is kind of my home organization, bipartisan nonprofit group in Washington, D.C. Um, so on part of it, we do work in a bipartisan way with Republicans and Democrats on things like ESSA and high level policy stuff. Um, but all of that work is that we have other teams that do a lot of that. I, I am able to take part in different pieces of that. But on a day to day basis, it's really working with school and district leaders across the country to support their they're transforming teaching and learning, and also to really highlight the great things that are going on in their schools on a regular face, basis. But here's what I'll say. Before all of that, I'm a dad first and a husband first. And my overall job is being, you know, family first in that regard. You know, because when I look in the eyes of my little eight-year-old girl or my five-year-old crazy little boy, when I look into their eyes, like, what is it that they need for their future? What is it? And my little boy is going to be the class of 2032. 
And, wow. and I think I, you know, I may have shared that in the keynote, but it, when you process that, not that it's about my kids, because it's not for me, it is, but for the rest of the people listening, it's not. But what is it that he's going to need in 2032? What are the skills he's going to need? You know, if theoretically he goes to a four year college and theoretically 2036, I think at this point he might be on the six year college plan the way it's shaping out here. But, <laughs> but, but what is the world of work going to look like in 2040? Because he's going to be entering a kindergarten in about a year. What are the skills he's going to need to start to develop? And what do the classrooms need to look like? And what are the learning experiences that he's going to need to be successful? And it's obviously really personal because that's my baby. That, that's how I look at it. But when I step back, here's what it comes down to. If it's what I expect from my own baby, and I don't mean expect from like a demand end in terms of like what I know my own kiddo is going to need it's got to also be good enough for every other child that's out there because I recognize in the work that I do, sure, my heart and my passion are driven and seen through the eyes of my own children. But at the end of the day, there's millions of those kiddos with families that love them just as much as I love my own. And what are the experiences those kids need as well? So what to, to sum up what I try and do, I try and support great school leaders and teachers and, and district level leaders to transform the system, to help make sure that the kids have the learning experiences that they need, but at the end of the day, to never forget why we do what we do. And that's putting relationships first and understanding that our work in education, I don't care if you're a kindergarten teacher, a custodian, or a superintendent, your job is loving and caring about kids and truly everything else is secondary to that. Wow. Absolutely. So much wow. good, so much awesomeness in there. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love your focus on it. You talked about this in the keynote that we saw. I love your focus and your, just your passion for focusing on what are these kids going to need because that, it's so different than what I needed when, when I graduated so many years ago from what I could, you know, I have, a, I have a son who's around the same age as yours. So it's that same thought process of what are they going to need in 2030? I love that. And I really, really love how you mentioned at the beginning, when you first started talking there about the about the school leaders not meaning not being title, um, because, and I think that's important for for teachers to hear more and more of is that it doesn't matter what your title is, it's 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 what you do and how you lead your school. Because I think we see we see you know we get to work with a lot of schools around the country and a lot of teachers, and we see teachers who are leaders who don't necessarily look at themselves that way because they haven't been told that they're leaders enough. And so I love that you're out there sharing that, pushing that to hey, look, you don't have to have that title in front of your name you are a leader. If you're running through walls, as you said, doing what's right for students. I love that. That's fantastic. You know what's, what's, what's interesting with that? Two, two different facets. Number one, to build off what you just said is sometimes teachers don't really, you know, realize they're leaders. And, and I can remember being pr a principal. I was a principal at a middle school and, and an elementary school for a number of years. And, um, and there'd be times I would say to a teacher, that's incredible. Like you are crushing it. That is, that is far better than I ever was able to t teach it. That's amazing. And they would almost look at me and be like, that, no, that that's just, that's how I do it. What, what do you mean? And, and didn't see the, I mean, you know, and they were incredibly talented, but didn't see themselves in looking in the mirror. It's like, wow, I am proud of that. That's awesome. And, you know, one thing school administrators need to do better is in those, those places where they have that. And let's face it, those are in every school in our country where teachers are crushing it for kids. What administrators need to do is number one, recognize that. Number two, also share with them, hey, how can you help lead and building that capacity in those te in all teachers, but in teachers like that to say, I need you to share that story with your colleagues because what you're doing is absolutely working. And so many times teachers don't get the opportunity to see that. And I think a failure of our structure, and, and I think back the way I designed my, my building schedule, a failure of that. And, and it, it, part of it's just the structure that we work under is teachers rarely get the opportunity to go hang with other teachers in the classroom, watch them teach, have conversation about the why. You know, we We've got funding issues or substitute issues. There's real issues there. I'm not sweeping those under the rug. But if teachers could do more and more of that, or if we had a culture where occasionally teachers say, yeah, you know what, maybe 30 minutes this month, I'll, I'll take 30 minutes of a prep period to go visit a colleague and just watch them do what they do. You know, and in cultures that happens and people absolutely do that in great cultures. But when we take a look at those pieces, people would even see, wow, we're two seventh grade English teachers that have two completely different styles yet are both really effective. You know, why did you teach it like that? I've never thought to do that. And that's the kind of thing that also improves practice. And, you know, one of the things that Eric and I wrote about in Learning Transformed in this notion, it's a passion area of mine, is this notion of professional learning. And what does it actually look like that actually works? And, and how do we move people forward? You know, because the traditional model of supervision, quite honestly, is a joke. I don't know how else to put it. And when we talk about professional learning like that, one of the best ways is that side by side, shoulder to shoulder, 
teacher to teacher, watching, observing. It's almost like you think back to we all did, you know, st student teaching when we were like 18 years old, right? And and we had somebody there giving us feedback, giving us ideas. We watched somebody that was doing, you know, somebody that was a mentor in that regard. And if we're going to shift teaching and learning, that's a great way to do it. There's certainly limits from a financial end or a time end, um, but certainly what it can also do is amplify the amazing things that are happening in our schools every day. This is, but I want to jump on one of the words you said was a failure in there. I want to talk about that. I want to flip us there. So um, you, you touched on one there, um, but can you tell us about a time that you've, you've failed? I mean, a lot of people hear all these accolades and all this experience that you have, and some people might think uh, Tom probably never failed. He's just been successful his whole life. And, and I know from talking with you before that that's probably not true. So can you, can you share with us a time that you failed and sort of like uh, take us there with you? How did you overcome it? And then really what, importantly is what did you learn from it? What did you take out of it? <laughs> so do you want me to start in like the past hour or the past day? <laughs> I, I mean, I, could go, I, 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 mean I, I think I fail more often than I'm successful. To be honest with you, in that regard, you know, I, I I look and part of where I get my my passion there, and, and um, you know, <laughs> there's a I don't know exactly how it was phrased, but when you look, um, there supposedly out there, Thomas Edison, I wasn't around back then, so I don't really know, um, said something along the lines of, you know, when he was trying to invent the light bulb he failed about 10,000 times or somewhere in that range. And I don't know if that's fully accurate or that's just been something that's passed down, but it's apparently it said at one point, you know, I didn't fail 10,000 times. I figured out 10,000 ways that won't work. Mm -hmm. You see, that's mindset. And so many times we come across this notion of failure and our culture has created failure as this awful and negative thing when ultimately we should be celebrating failures at times. And, and I know that sounds kind of like pie in the sky, but, but hear me out a minute. So I, first and foremost, I fail every day. I, I truly fail every day. There's times where, you know, I was speaking the other day and I walked off being like, you know, you guys, thanks for the accolades saying, wow, that was one of the best I ever heard while well, I was speaking the other day. And I walked off being like, that wasn't my best. Like I, I brought it and I, I, I wanted it, but I, I think that was like not even average. And, and for me, it was like that expectation of, I want it to be good. I want people to walk through. I want them to feel motivated. I want them to learn something. And I don't feel like that happened. So let me tell you about a time that maybe people can relate to. And um, so one of the, one of the failures I had early on was a mindset problem. So let me tell you, 18 years ago, 18 years ago, I was one-to-one -one in my classroom. Wow. Palm pilots. Mm. Palm pilots. No remember, remember those things, right? Yeah. So, you know, you, you now, on one hand, it's kind of the beginning to mobility. On the other hand, it's hysterical because I look back at newspaper articles and I was quoted as saying, I believe these things could help revolutionize education <laughs> and change, right? And how silly it sounds in retrospect all these years later. But 18 years ago, that was cutting edge, mm -hmm. right? So here's a quick story with that. It, here's, the, here's the bottom line of where I'm going. Let me drop it like this. I led with technology, not with learning. Okay. So here's where I'm going with this. So I get these Palm Pilots because I was the kind of teacher I felt, you know, hey, I'll try something. If it doesn't go well, I'll try it again. That's just kind of been my mindset. Hey, I'll give it a go and let's give it a shot. I also had an administrator that created a culture where I could take risks and I wasn't fearful of trying something new that if it failed, he was going to, you know, be barking down my throat because in cultures of fear, innovation is not going to thrive. And so what happened was I knew I was getting observed on like a, I think it was like a Thursday. And so I get my lesson plan fully together. I'm going to use the Palm pilots because I want them to be impressed. And so this new technology we had just invested in. So I'm like, I'm going to crush this. And of course the, I knew he was coming. So the dog and pony show is coming out. Right. So anyway, so that Thursday comes through, it's about a 30 minute lesson that he wanted to come see. It happened to be like spelling. So it's kind of funny, like in retrospect, did I really spend like 30 minutes on a spelling piece? Like, and, and even just that stuff. And, and no, that's not the main failure. Here's my point here. So, so for 30 minutes, I want you to follow this for a minute. For 30 minutes, every kid was 100% engaged. So what I had them do is, you know, they were, they were practicing their spelling words. They were working on different themes. So what, in using the palms, what I had them do is they partner up and one kid would say the question, you know, that say that the word, the other kid had to write it on the palm. They had to beam it over. That kid would then they, that kid would then look at it and compare it. And, yeah, you got that right. Nice job. All right, next word. I'm going to go to you. And so I, they were you. They were basically using the palm pilots to write the word and exchange it back and forth. Okay, so follow this logic. For uh, 30 straight minutes, every kid was 100% engaged. Second piece, every kid 
did exactly what I asked them. I, I felt like I was like, it's almost like I'm paying them because I'm getting observed. Like this is, I am my mindset at that. I was like, I am crushing it. My lesson plan was like followed to the minute. And I'm like, this is awesome. I can't wait. You know, it was kind of like the, the, the 30th minute ticked and I dropped the mic and walked out the door. Like, yep, that's how you do it. Like that was kind of my mindset. Right. Mm -hmm. So I was like, I am crushing it. This is awesome. Next day I have the post observation. I walked down to, to my, to my principal. I sit down across from him. My chest is out a little bit. I'm like, I can't wait to hear him tell me all the great things that I did yesterday. Like, here it comes. Like, give it to me, baby. Tell me exactly how well I did. Right. <laughs> so, so he says to me, he says, uh, you know, like a lot of principals will, he kind of looks at me, smiles. And again, the relationship was there. He created a culture in our building where we could take risks, but he was also, it wasn't just, Hey, this is a fun zone. Like he would push us. And I, that's what made him a really good principal. And so he, he looks across his desk and or across the table we were sitting at. And like a lot of principals will ask, a lot of teachers have heard. So Tom, how do you think it went? And I said, oh, well, like I, my lesson plan was followed to a T and I had a hundred percent, I think a hundred percent of kids were engaged. And every time I had a question, I asked it like every hand went up. I, I, I Bill, I think this was really pretty good. So he looked across from me and he said, so Tom, so, so tell me about the learning you wanted to happen. Tell me about the, the, the student outcome, the learning objectives you were looking for. And my response was, so I wanted to use the Palm Pilots to be able to, he, he said, no, stop, stop, stop. I, what was the learning you wanted to occur? And I'm like, uh, maybe he didn't hear me. Like, uh, <laughs> we wanted to use the Palm Pilots to be able to. He's like, Tom, stop, stop. Listen to yourself. I'm asking you about learning. You start by telling me about the tool. He said, Tom, here's my gut instinct. I really believe you planned that lesson and did that lesson for 30 minutes, more so because the Palm Pilots could do something, not because it was the best way to learn something. And I will tell you that moment and that, that conversation from that real conversation with the principal that created a culture where it pushed me to take risks, but would also push the instructional high level learning. He said, Tom, really, let me ask you this. Could you have done that lesson in probably five to 10 minutes without any technology and have the exact same outcomes? And I'll tell you, I remember like pausing and saying, you know, yeah, I, I could have. And so when I look at it, number one, failure, and I know I tell, I, I, I kind of share that from a prideful end purposefully, because mm -hmm. I remember feeling like, man, I got, this is awesome. Like I am crushing this. I remember that feeling, but I will tell you what I respect most about my principal. Number one is it wasn't just pat on the back. Wow. Every kid was hundred percent engaged. Cause here's what's interesting. When you're using technology, you can have a hundred percent engagement, a hundred percent digital. And like I had a hundred percent low level learning. And so failure there was my own lens, my own mindset. And the failure being that because it was cool, because it was shiny, because my principal was coming in, I wanted it to look good because we had invested in it. I wanted to show them all the kids had learned and could do with it. But my focus was on the tool. My focus was not on what needed the students needed to learn best. So I will tell you, when we talk about fail forward, I could show you where I was stand, where I was sitting when I had that conversation. And it was 18 years ago now. And I will tell you, I honestly don't believe it. I, I, I actually just told the story yesterday and that's why it was on the, I was working with teachers yesterday yesterday in, in Texas. And, um, and I, I, um, when I was thinking through the, the pieces, they, we, the notion of failure came up and I was telling the story and said, you know, I could show you where I was sitting. And, and I would also say that moment fundamentally shifted my mindset in technology because I'm a huge advocate for ed tech. When, I mean, you heard me speak and, and like, you know, I share, I'm a huge advocate for ed tech, but it's when it's used well. Because we're investing loads of money in technology that if we're real about it, is a colossal waste of money. And it, it's it's that notion of, and I'm not talking about a particular segment or a, pic, or a particular app, or any, I don't mean it like that. It's about the use. You know, like we talk about this notion, we've talked about like the digital divide for like 20 years now. That's, you know, the has and the has nots. And, and I don't say it to downplay it like that. I'm talking about the digital use divide. And that's something that was coined by the NETP, which is the National Ed Tech Plan, uh, I believe about two years ago. That's that notion of that active versus passive use. In other words, how the technology is being used. You see, like you can go one to one in your district or you can be one to one in your classroom. But if the instructional pedagogy isn't shifting, if we're not focused on higher level, you know, deeper learning types of things, we're really just wasting money. Like if all we're doing is digitizing past practice, so it used to be on a worksheet and now it's on a Chromebook and we're celebrating it, like shame on us.
Mm-hmm. You know, and so when we look through the pieces, and I look at my own failure there. It was that lesson by an administrator, by a, it was an administrator, it was my principal that was willing to push me in an area that I needed to be pushed. He he did go back through and said, you know, were kids 100% engaged? Yeah, they were. That, that's, that's great. But they're engaged on low level stuff. And so something like engagement is a double edged word. You know, I, I bet you, you asked the, the word and it's kind of a trick question, but if you ask a hundred educators, is engagement a good thing? A hundred, 99 of them will say yes, right? That one mm-hmm. just didn't misheard the question, right? But at the end of the day, a hundred percent engagement on low level learning is really a waste of time. And so, you know, like, think about it. I hand high school calculus kids uh, a three page sheet of single edition problems and I get a hundred percent engagement. And they finished in 15 minutes. I had 100% engagement. They all did exactly what I asked them to do. They all had 100%. Was it worth their time? Nope. Mm -hmm. And so when we look at those pieces, that really hit home for me because it really gave me the lens of, I've got some great devices here. I have some, and and I had four desktops in the back of the classroom back then, you know? Um, And and as my my career evolved and I had a one-to-one later in my teaching career, making sure that I wasn't using technology for technology's sake and making sure I started really with that question of what's the learning that my kids need? And then the flip side to that, what's the best way to get there? Because I'll say truly, you can be amazingly innovative with no technology and you can be amazingly traditional with all the technology in the world. And so when you think about that piece, that changed me and that failure forward, that lesson learned, I will tell you, I didn't leave that principal's office with my head down. There's times from a supervision end um, and having been a former principal where he could have ripped my heart out. He didn't. He challenged me and he challenged me the next time I use it. How can we use something that for like, you know, a deeper level learning, higher level learning what that piece is. And so I left their challenge with my head up. My ego might have been hurt a little bit because I was expecting the accolades for 30 (laughs) minutes. But that that was good for me in that sense. And so that failing forward really gave me a lesson. I would honestly say, and this is what I started to say that I, uh, I said yesterday in Texas is if that conversation never happened or if that principal over the course of that year never really pushed that with me, I honestly don't think I'd be doing what I'm doing today. Like, and what I mean by that is if I just kind of just kept going like, Hey, here's the coolest app. Here's the the neatest little neatest trend. Here's the little thing you can get so consumed in the shiny and the bright and the newest and the latest and totally miss the teaching and learning side of things. You know, I, I don't know if I'd be doing what I'm doing today if I didn't see that early on and not to say that I perfected it for the rest of the career. That is not the case. I spent countless money as a tech director on things that I thought were great ideas that if I look back in retrospect, were probably a colossal waste of taxpayer money. And so it's not that I never failed forward under that in a mindset. It was that mindset shifted for me early on because I had somebody that pushed me to think differently about it. You know, it's so interesting time. We talked about like a ton of information that I really, really connected with. One specific element is Tiffany Ott, who's a part of our Teach Better team, is constantly challenging me with tech, very similar to it sounds like your principal did when you were experiencing this whole process of using text with purpose, right? Really ensuring that it's that it's a valuable use and not a replacement of something that already exists, right? What else can you create? But another element that I know you talked about in the very beginning was that Edison quote, right? How do you make a light bulb? Well, I found, you know, a million ways not to make a light bulb and and now I figured it out. And how do we then echo that in the classroom? You know, I'm actually a sixth grade teacher. I love to, you know, hang out with my 11 and 12 year olds and, you know, I teach math. So, you know, everyone loves math, right? (laughs) But one of my favorite things is, you know, you go through a problem, order of operations and a student doesn't get the right answer. And rather than sit there and say, oh, try it again, it's, oh my gosh, you discovered one of the million ways to not solve this correctly. You know, like, how can we celebrate that? You know, my students often joke, we we use um, a reflection tool. They film videos all uh, every single day. And one of the reflection questions is, what failure can you celebrate today? So it's hysterical to have a student on Seesaw, which is the app we use, say, oh my gosh, I figured out the perfect way not to solve order of operations. You know, that, that <laughs> but, but that's, that, it's a mindset thing, you know, mm-hmm. and if, if we're real, it, one of the best ways to do that as a teacher is to model it. So yeah. when you screw it up, because it's going to happen, sh- like sh- be, 
you know, be um, not afraid to share with your, your kiddos, you know, I really messed that one up. I, I made that mistake. And even if the kids didn't catch it, point it out. Number one, it shows you're human. Number two, we're people. We're going to mess things up. We're going to make mistakes. And I think part of what, what gets us down as teachers is our biggest critics sometimes are the person we see in the mirror in the morning. And I'm not talking about a spouse, right? The person that we see in the mirror can be our biggest critics. And, and when we look at some of the, those pieces, failure is a part of growth and teaching. And, you know, here I am and sure, yeah, I've been doing this work nationally, blah, 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 blah. That's all well and good. And I'm doing all that. But I fail all the time in my decision-making with it, regardless of all that experience or any accolade that you may have mentioned. It's a part of growth and it's a part of low life. And I'll tell you, you know, when I had that the other day and had that experience feeling like, man, that, that wasn't my best. I'll tell you, I, I was sick to my stomach because I, I wanted it to be perfect and I wanted it to bright. And I just knew it wasn't up to what I, I expected myself and what I wanted. On it. And I think educators, I think we're perfectionists by nature. You know, I think we, we design this lesson and we expect it to go perfect the very first time. So we teach it the next day and we, we thought it was going to all go well and good. And then what we notice is like, yeah, that Wi-Fi went down and so nothing worked and it was a colossal waste of time. And, and then we don't want to try it again because we, you know, like we're fearful of that. But we have to have the mindset that, you know, when we're trying new things, when we're when we're learning new things ourselves, we are going to fail and it's OK. And for, you know, building leaders like a principal that's listening to this, their mindset really needs to be is expect that your staff is going to fail over and over and over. But find ways to leverage those to turn them into positives or to take them to that next step forward. But also it starts with us. And it's that word of modeling. If I'm the principal listening to this, how do you model failing forward to your staff? Or if I'm that teacher listening to this or that sixth grade teacher, by the way, you middle school teachers are all nuts, by the way. They are oh, crazy. <laughs> <laughs> hey, as a former middle school teacher, I could say that myself, right? Yeah. But, but when we think about that, how do you model then to middle school? And if you're talking, think about middle school kids. I mean, what, like you're a, like a 13 year old, how crazy is a 13 year old? They're like a hormone <laughs> on skates, right? Like they are failing all the time. Like they, it's, you know what I mean? Just in terms of that age group, they, 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 from the emotional side to the friendship side, to the teaching and learning, well, the learning side for them, they're failing all the time. And if we as middle school teachers in that case, don't celebrate our own failures and share with them, you know, I really messed that up or, Hey, yesterday I shared this and maybe I was wrong about that. It, it comes across almost, it can, it can come across to kids as my teacher knows everything and my job is to absorb it and think and learn as much as I can so I can spit it back to them later. And if, if that's the mindset, if a kid has, man, have we failed them because we have to show them that we are learners right alongside them. You want to motivate your kids to learn, show them over and over and over again, how you as the adult are learning as well at whatever level that they are at. And it'll show them, Hey, I'm not here as the grand knowledge. Like one of the things I often say, and I wrote it in Learning Transformed is, is that, you know, if, if your mindset at a teacher right now is that your main job is content delivery, like you've been outsourced by YouTube and Netflix <laughs> because like kids can get that content at any point online. And don't, I don't want, want anybody to misunderstand what I'm saying. Of course, content's important. Of course, the content piece is important. But if, if our mindset is that our, 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 what we're supposed to do is give information, they can get that information on demand anywhere they want on multiple devices. The best teachers I know are what? They're far more than just content delivery. And, and I'm not minimizing content. Of course, that's important. But when we think about it, when it gets to the heart of teaching, what is it? It's modeling for kids life experiences, life lessons, and life skills that they can move, loving them to the point of doing whatever it takes. Because every educator out there, or most educators have taught in a place where they've got that kiddo coming in that morning that's from that shattered home where mom just left because dad was beating her because whatever the case might be that's walking in looking up you know I, I heard Manny Scott speak at ASCD and one of the things that I heard him say that just it gives me chills even just to even repeat his words is that you know even on our west best day I'm sorry even on our worst day as a teacher you are some child's best hope mm. and those are those are Manny Scott's words for that and I fully give him credit for that but I, that I can't let go of that because you know as teachers again we beat ourselves up we look in the news we get trashed we look in our community quite often we're getting paid too much we get you know whatever the things that are out there and if we let those negativities on the outside build like rip apart our heart on the inside we lose our effectiveness and so what does that get to we are in this together and we think about from a teaching end and from a learning end, from a schooling end, like if we are not building each other up on the inside of our school walls, 
number one, shame on us. But number two, there is no way in the world they're going to be doing it on the outside of the school walls for us. If we can't build each other up teacher for teacher, how in the world as a profession can we move forward? You know, when we look at rates of people and the amounts of people that want to be teachers are drastically dropping, like why is that? And that crushes my heart for the future of our nation because teaching is the greatest profession in the world. But when we when we look on the outside and we get trashed and many teachers work below poverty, like on wages that are below the poverty level in certain states, especially in the South, and then we trash them what they do and tell them they're not good enough and you're working in the neediest school in the nation, but your scores aren't high enough and whatever the case might be, how do we build each other up? And, and I'll give you guys kudos and in podcasts like this that you guys will continue to do to encourage teachers to show them those. Uh, but one of my best friends, a guy named Jimmy Cox, I was listening to Jimmy the other day. We were doing some work together and he kept calling it a merchant of hope. And, you know, when you think about that notion of being a merchant of hope for kids, it's looking in the eyes of that seven-year-old, you know, second grade student and seeing the future possibilities in that inner kid even when they're driving you insane with a thousandth question that day, you know, and when we look at those people's teachers truly are those merchants of hope for kids. And as educators, we need to build each other up. I, I, I'm really active on social media. And I got to tell you, in the past month, I've seen insane amounts of people, teacher to teacher, tearing each other down, ripping apart people as people. And what I don't mean by that, yeah, we've got to have hard conversations in education, hard conversations about things like equity, hard conversations about, you know, things things that have been dramatic issues since our nation started in terms of how um, access to things for, say, our students of color or, you know, areas of computer science for our females and things that are really hard conversations to how do we move forward as a nation in that when it hasn't been going so well. We've got to have those conversations, but we as educators aren't working forward to solutions if we're more interested in looking better than the person across the hall or if we're more interested in being the building that outperforms the building on the other side of the street, our kids lose. And it's our moral and ethical obligation to do what we can for that future generations. You know, and I, in the last piece here, I often, I often joke, but like when I'm the guy that's in the old age home and can hardly know my name anymore, it's this generation that's going to be taking care of me, <laughs> what? you know, and that gets to the social emotional side. We get so about scores and data and learning. That's part of the equation, the learning side. We're here for whole kids. Kids are not data points. Kids are, when you look at the whole side, where's the whole child? Where's that heart? Where's the person that sees the, the kid as the whole being and not as a test score? They're teaching in our classrooms every day. And so we can never lose sight of why we do what we do. It's about loving and caring about kids. I love it, Tom. This is I'm, I'm going to listen to this episode like 50 times. I'm going to go back. Your passion is just, it's infectious. I'm loving every second of it. I'm going to put a challenge to you right now, though. I got six questions I'm going to throw at you, and we're going to do them in 15 seconds or less. Are oh, you, boy. Should I, you, should I, hey, after a you, late night flight, I have no <laughs> idea what's about to come out of my mouth, but go all ahead. Right, so, all right. So here we go. Six, 15 seconds or less, six questions. What is one ed tech tool that you cannot live without? So I'll give you a, a personal one because you said me and not for kids necessarily. Huge advocate of social media, not because of the the glitzy and the glamoury, but because of the relationships that are built and connected for educators around the world. Love it. Agree. What book are you reading right now? Reading my one of my best friend's books, uh, Culturize by Jimmy Casas. Full disclosure, it's my second time reading it. I get encouraged. I get inspired. I shed some tears, even though I know some of the stories personally. Uh, incredible book called Culturize by Jimmy Casas. It's about school culture. Absolutely. I love that Phen one. Yes, phenomenal book. Uh, who do we need to follow on Twitter uh, today, right now? So let me give a shout out to uh, reference Future Ready Schools, and that's something that I run. Uh, Future Ready is, yes, I help, I help run that as the director of innovation, but we have over 70 practitioners that are working in schools on a day-to-day -day basis that are helping to lead that work. You know, when we talk about Future Ready principles, we've got 70 principles, or not 70, 15 principles that are helping to lead that work. So I'm going to give my advisors a shout out. So our district leadership strand, incredible people to follow. Joe Sanfilippo being one superintendent in Wisconsin. Our principal strand is run by uh, Jimmy Casas, Brad Gustafson in, in Minnesota. Our instructional coaches strand is Brianna Hodges in Texas, Sarah Thomas in um 
in for, uh, Virginia or no Maryland, sorry, right next to each other there. Uh, and our tech piece, I'll give a shout out to Vince Shivert, who's uh, a, a well-known tech director, CIO of the year, and Carl Hooker in Texas. Final one, librarians, our fi- librarian strand, Shannon Miller, incredible when it comes to, to librarians and that work. And I'll give a shout out to Mark Ray. They run the librarian strand. So first and foremost, it's about people that are leading schools every day, working in schools every day. They are amazing people. First and foremost, as people and as educators, and I know I'm way over 15 seconds. That's right. That's awesome. And guys, as always, I'm going to link all those in in the show notes so you'll be able to go and follow every single one of those awesome folks there. Uh, Number four is best YouTube channel for educators. Hmm. Yeah, I'm going to go with common sense education. Here's why incredible things around things like fake news and digital citizenship and things that are just so prevalent and relevant right now. They've got a lot of great resources. All right. Give us one daily, weekly, or monthly routine that every teacher should get into. Spend time with your family. I'll tell you from my own failures, I lose sight of that very quickly. Could they go, the go, the go. Teachers quite often spend so much more time and pour all their energy into other people's children or spouses. Make sure you have something left for your own by the time you get home. And this one, I, I, I'm guessing it would be tough to do in 15 seconds, but I'm going to try and challenge you to it. Best pieces of advice you've ever received. It's easy. My mentor, my very first day of teaching before the bell rang, looked at me and said, Tom, this job is about loving and caring about kids. Everything else is about secondary. I've said it probably three times. He told it to me before the very first bell rang the very first day. Relationships, relationships, relationships. Awesome. Love it. Well, I probably have the most important question for you that we've asked you the entire time. We've gotten so much value out of this. How can our listeners connect with you? Because I know firsthand that listening to your keynote was fantastic, but really being a part of your PLN, your social media network has been so inspiring as well. So what's the best way for everyone to get in contact with you? Sure. I'll give a couple avenues. One on Twitter, referenced that earlier. I'm Thomas C. Murray and try and share out and a reason to connect, you know, kind of the why, like why would I waste my time connecting with Tom? I try and share a lot of relevant and great resources and tools that are out there on a day-to-day basis. This isn't sharing, here's Tom. This is sharing what's going on. How do we connect? How do we do that? That's first piece. Second piece, on my website, thomascmurray.com, I try and put a lot of tools and resources that can help. Like for instance, our teachers listening, one of my blog posts was like 300 or, or more digital tools for your classroom as recommended by teachers. And so it's a great resource of digital tools that can support it, but all uh, put through resources for teachers. So I write blogs and those kinds of things to be able to support and to help. Um, And I do have a Facebook page as well, facebook.com slash Thomas C. Murray LLC, which is just posting some updates, posting blogs, videos, those kinds of things to help support there as well, as well as my latest book, Learning Transformed. A lot of the thoughts I even shared today, you'll find in there as well, Learning Transformed. Um, eight keys to designing tomorrow's schools today. I almost forgot it. That's the lack of sleep <laughs> on the subtitle, I guess. Right. Um, but just a lot of the things that the work that we do, a lot of the conversations we've had, Eric Scheninger and I putting down, trying to, in one spot, if we're going to help try and transform teaching and learning, what are the keys? And that's what we came up with. And there it is. Well, Thomas, thank you so, so much for taking time out of your day. We know you're busy and we, we love uh, chatting with you. Your passion, your, your experience is just absolutely priceless. Really appreciate it. You guys listening, you can uh, find, as always, find all the links and all the resources that we've talked about and that Thomas has mentioned today in this episode over at teachbetter.com, as well as those really important uh, links for connecting with with Tom. So make sure you head over to uh, teachbetter.com for all of that. And be sure to hit subscribe, subscribe, if I could say the word correctly, so you don't miss any of the episodes. And if you can give us a rating and a review, we'd really appreciate that as well. Thomas, we really appreciate your time. And guys, until next time, let's get out there and let's teach better.